Hello, my name is Melissa Dallas. I'm the Senior Environment and Sustainability Officer with Bega Cheese Limited in Australia. I work for in our environmental program, um, looking at um, trying to improve the sustainability of our supply of our um, dairy farm suppliers, and uh, with a view to try and ensure that they remain sustainable in the long term. So part of that role has been um, undertaking environmental assessments of all our farms, and we've been able to get some data on best environmental best practice and. And um, that has been useful in trying to analyse some of the data that we've been able to, um, to generate. So with this poster we focus specifically on heat stress and looking at a particular event that happened in January 2014. We had a, a four days um, of temperatures above 100 degrees and we wanted to see what impact that had on milk volume. We also wanted to see what impact the um, the adoption of best practice for minimising heat stress had on that particular event. So what we looked at is, what you can see in this, in this chart here, is that, that as a result of that event there was a significant decline in milk volume, um, daily milk volume. In comparison with um, a, a year, the, pre, uh, the uh, 2015 year um, for the same time period, was a bit closer to the average. So we had um, in comparison to a more average year, we had a significant decline as a result of that heat stress event. So then what we looked at is we couldn't separate um, high, um, uh, herds, high producing herds and lower producing herds, but what we could do was look at milk volume. And so we separated the, um, the suppliers into higher milk volume farms. So it's farms producing more than 11,360 pounds per day and lower producing farms. So that's farms producing less than 11,360 pounds per day. So then we just sort of see what, what difference there was in those two, in those, those different farms. And we noticed that with the higher volume farms, as a result of the onset of the heat stress day, or the, the heat wave, there was an immediate decrease in milk, milk volume that was detectable. With the lower producing farms, the heat stress or the reduction in milk volume didn't start until towards the end of the event. Now that could have been masked a little bit by skip a day pickup collection. But we would have expected to see a decrease prior to that because they get picked up every second day. So we would have expected to see it a bit before, before the end of that event. So I'm not too sure why that's the case. So then when we looked at best practice for um, uh, sort of, uh, adoption of best practices to reduce the impact of heat stress, we looked at uh, with the industry recommends that there be plenty of um, suitable sufficient drinking water available. Uh, there's plenty of um, drinking water, particularly the exit of the dairy after milking. There's plenty of shelter belts or shade structures in the paddocks to reduce heat stress. Probably worthwhile indicating that in dairy in Australia, all our farms are pasture based, so they're not shedded. So they're year round out in the pasture. So we are um, reliant on, heavily on pastures and, um, and shade and shelter in those pastures to minimise heat stress. And then um, installing um, cooling systems at the dairy, so that's shade structures and sprinkle systems or one or two of the both. So what we found was with the 52 farms that we looked at in this assessment and we focused on, um, we focused on for this project on uh, farms in the Gippsland and Western Districts of Victoria, these areas um, are not, um, days above 100 degrees aren't uncommon, but consecutive days of, of, of above 100 degrees is very uncommon. Um, in our supply regions further to the north, um, certainly heat stress is a particular issue, but it's more common in that area to have that issue. So we focused on this area where it's not, not as common, um, but the 52 farms, so 26 farms had adopted all recommendations for, for, for recommended practices of heat stress, and 26 farms had only adopted one or two of the recommended practices. It should be highlighted that none of the farms, none of our suppliers lost any cows during that event, but there were um, reported stock losses as a result of that heat wave event in our, on other dairy farms. So. Um, Obviously, the management practices that people had adopted had were successful in preventing stock deaths, which was a, um, a major, um, a major bonus. But in terms of milk production, there were significant losses. So when we looked at the results for the a more average year, so for the 2015 year, this is the milk daily milk production for 2015. You can see that farms that adopted recommended basic, recommended management practices for heat stress had higher milk volume, daily milk volume, in comparison to the average of all the farms. So you can see that you know, on an average year there, was, there are benefits in um, adopting those recommended practices. For farms producing less than 11,360 um, pounds per day, 
there was no difference, significant difference between those that adopted rec all the recommendation pra recommended practices and those that hadn't. So I, difficult to explain that one, but with those ones it just wasn't um, noticeable. During the heatwave event in 2014 for the same farms, you can see the farms that adopted recommendation, recommended practices for heat stress were still above, um, still produced high milk volume in comparison to the, the average of all the farms. But when it came to the actual heat wave, they really came back to the pack, so they still lost um, significant milk volume as a result of that event. Um, so there's still, we can see that there's still work to be done, but there are benefits in adopting best practice, but you still suffer significant losses. For the farms that had lower than 11,360 pounds per day, um, it's rather surprising, but the farms that adopted recommendation, recommended practice heat stress showed that there was a um, there was no, there's not only no benefit, there was actually a, um, a penalty to adopting best practice. So they actually um, were worse off, and I can't explain that either. Um, but yeah, that's a difficult one, and it's a difficult one to explain, but certainly we'll still be recommending the adoption of recommended practices, uh, particularly for our higher volume farms. Um, but you can tell that the adoption of best practice alone isn't going to help us protect us or uh, buffer us from milk volume loss as a result of heat stress events. It'll help us save cows, and we certainly haven't lost any, didn't lose any cows, we only stock deaths, but um, in terms of trying to protect uh, milk uh, volume, um, the key thing is that, um, as I, over here you'll notice, as a result of that heat wave event, there was a significant drop in volume, and the volume never recovered. So it was, it was like a trigger for, a, um, for drawing off. So they, it was a sort of, um, we've noticed that, that as a result of that, that event, rather than just maybe holding at that line there um, for the rest of the season, as a result we've lost that significant volume in milk. So that's a major, major impact on the company. And certainly um, if we're going to continue, we'll be continuing to recommend best practice, but we need further assistance to help us uh, maintain or, or help our farmers to improve that, um, that, that volume loss um, during those heat stress periods. So um, thank you for your time. <laughs>